Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 294. This week the questions are taken from guides 370 and 371, and that's the guides of the Dan A or D class cruisers and the Miyoko class cruisers, along with the Wednesday videos with the second interview with Captain Larry Sechrist of USS Iowa and the origins of the Imperial Japanese Navy together with the Friday video on Frigate Jewels of the War of 1812, United States versus Macedonian. So believe it or not, <laughs> that means we are actually in the same year with dry dock questions, because those videos went up in late January 2024. So, shall we begin? The Homeless Dreamer asks, The co-reign of William and Mary predates the label HMS, but what would happen if there were another case of two monarchs in Britain? It's fortunate that both his and her start with H, and thus HMS is unaffected, but in this scenario, would it change to TMS, Their Majesty's Ships? Well, I think that such a scenario is actually technically impossible now. The reason for the joint monarchy of William and Mary was in part because it was, well, William who was actually invited over to take over the country initially, because he was the one who had you know, the power as the the one in charge of the Netherlands. And that was further complicated by the fact that actually William had in and of himself a relatively decent claim to the throne. His wife, Mary, had a better claim, uh, which according to British tradition meant that she should be the queen because she was the one with the best claim. But with William kind of right behind her, as it were, with... Uh, a good claim of his own plus the fact that you know he wanted to be king and he was quite clear that that was what he his aim was they ended up coming up with this sort of fudge of joint sovereignty however you can see in the immediate aftermath of their reign when you get to the reign of queen anne although she is also married her husband does not have a claim to the british throne and as a result she just reigns as queen anne and the same thing you have queen victoria uh, Prince Albert did not have a claim to the English throne. Well, not any one of any particular proximity. And so he did not become King Albert because the one with the best claim to the throne was the one who should have the ultimate regnal power. And at the time, of course, King is above Queen. Uh, so therefore, it could be Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. You could not have Queen Victoria and King Albert. And then more recently, of course, um, although Prince Philip technically speaking had a very distant claim to the British throne it was nowhere near as good a claim as of course Queen Elizabeth II and once again you had Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip so later tradition essentially now establishes that the one with the best claim will have the superlative title and the other one will just have to accept that their best effort is going to be Prince however of course, there is the other fact that more recently, British law with regards to the succession of the monarch has changed so that uh, previously it would be the monarch's oldest son who would inherit the throne. Now it's simply the monarch's oldest child. That does mean that we're due for, well, we've got a king at the moment in the UK and we're due for another two kings, assuming nothing tragic happens. But in theory, the you know when Prince William's children grow up and have their own families, if whichever one of them, I forget exactly which, who's next in line after William has a daughter, then she would be in the direct line of succession. And similarly, if that line would have no further children, then the search for the next nearest relative would be the next nearest relative in the line rather than the next nearest male relative. So... Whereas the situation with William and Mary was they had to invite William because William was the one in charge, as I said, over in the Netherlands. Nowadays, if they were in a similar but hopefully not quite glorious revolution type situation, according to British law as it stands at the moment, as far as I understand it, they could just invite whoever in the, the Mary equivalent straight over. 
without having to make any particular appeal one way or the other to her husband. And so both past precedent and more recent constitutional will make it likely that even if you had a William and Mary situation where the husband had a claim, even if it was weaker than his wife's, you almost certainly just end up with queen whoever and prince whoever. But even if you didn't, there would still be a precedence. You know, one person has the stronger claim, they would ultimately have the regnal power, and therefore it would remain as his or her majesty's ship, depending on whoever had the better claim to the throne. Scott Mason asks... Given the size of the Imperial German Navy compared to the French Navy, why didn't the Germans plan a naval invasion of France in 1914? Was it just inexperience in this type of warfare, or did they think, well, they're already right next to each other? And what do you think would have been the result of them doing this? Could they have stopped Britain from joining the war, seeing as how the Germans technically would now not have to go through Belgium? Well, there's a few reasons why they didn't do it. Uh, Firstly, if you're building an invasion fleet, that means you need you know, transports, landing craft, etc., etc., bearing in mind that you have to skip both the Netherlands and Belgium at the absolute minimum, bearing in mind your target, if you're the Germans, is Paris, you are going to be, assuming you leave from Wilhelmshaven, you're going to have to go about 450 miles absolute minimum to land somewhere between Le Havre and Calais, somewhere maybe in the region of Dieppe, which might then allow you to advance via Rouen to Paris. The the big problem with that is obviously that requires quite a lot of investment in landing craft and naval forces when by 1912 the German army was already drawing down quite heavily on the German Navy's funding. And even if you manage to persuade them that, you know, we should we should build this invasion fleet and the invasion fleet of transports and landing craft that can cover 450 to 500 miles is just as capable of going for the british coast which is going to send the british into absolute paroxysms of paranoia um, which if anything if it's even possible is going to make the british naval build up even more insane and intense um, which yeah that's going to be something of a fly in the overall ointment and then of course you have the fact that even if you do successfully carry out this landing you've got to keep those men supplied because now you don't have supply lines leading right from germany because you can't supply them via belgium uh which is going to be a bit of a problem because you're going to have to have transport cycling through the fact that the dover straits are quite narrow means that even if the marine nationale is overall outnumbered they can probably put up a pretty stiff defense of the that uh, section of the channel if they want to especially considering that they can have all their destroyers and mines and submarines etc positioned over a fairly narrow front that the germans have to actually force their way through and all of this assumes british passivity because well a very large german fleet escorting a massive amphibious invasion force entering the channel is you know every penny dreadful writer for the last 50 years absolute worst nightmare and the chances that britain which is allied with france via the triple entente is going to just sit there and trust that the germans are going to go after northern france even assuming they're not joining in because of the entente that's not going to happen the british you know sending a massive amphibious task force through the dover Strait is 99.999% 99.999% going to be a tripwire for the British gate. No, this is this is too stupid. This is too much of a risk. We're blowing you all out of the water anyway. So you're going to get the British involved. And even if somehow, completely uncharacteristically, the British is just like, yeah, sure, whatever, we don't care. Um, and and or maybe the Germans land at Dunkirk, right on the at the very edge of the Franco-Belgian border. Fisher is going to be basically on bended knee to the government day and night going, you know, look, there's a huge chunk of German troops whose supplies and ability to operate are entirely dependent on a seaborne connection that's literally within shore based gun range of the mainland of the UK. And which of necessity is going to have a good chunk, if not all of the high seas fleet escorting it. They're all pinned in place. They can't go anywhere anywhere. 
this is the the best scenario for the utter destruction of the german navy we're ever going to get please 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 with the cherry on top can we do it and there's even a marginal chance that fisher might go ahead and do it anyway uh, you know on the basis of better to uh, ask forgiveness than permission so yeah for that reason as well as the you know funding and building the things reasons it's just not practical and even if in a completely ahistorical move the british completely ignore this and allow the germans to move on and just like well they didn't invade belgium so we're just going to sit pretty and watch you again have the problem of one the germans are attacking the bit of the french coast that's probably the single most heavily fortified from you know the whole of the 19th century paranoia between britain and france and once again, you know, they have all these ships and supply ships and everything they've somehow managed to build all tied to specific ports, assuming the French didn't blow up those ports, which they probably would have anyway. And so, you know, French submarines, fast attack craft, destroyers, anything that the Marine Nationale still has to hand will all be journeying up and down the channel night and day, doing their level best to disrupt all of this. So it, it would be a absolutely colossal risk that in any realistic scenario is going to end up with the british descending on the force with a like a ton of bricks right when the germans are the most vulnerable and even in the most optimistic scenarios it's going to be a hugely costly hugely expensive way of doing things which overall is probably going to sap so much german funding before the war and strength during the war that it might actually compromise the german advance uh, via Mets and so forth from the direct border area. Paludion asks, would it have been better for the Japanese to build more heavy cruisers instead of Yamato and Musashi, tactically and resources-wise? I know cruisers armed with 8-inch guns would have a little bit of a hard time going toe-to-toe -to -toe with battleships, but maybe their long lances would give them an edge? And likewise, would it have been interesting for the Japanese to try and build super cruisers armed with 10-inch guns or something like the Deutschlands, i.e. AK pocket battleships in media terms at the time. They're somewhat less powerful than 18-inch battleships, but they could have had more of them and used them more frequently. In hindsight, yes, the Japanese probably would have been better off with more heavy cruisers than Yamato and Musashi. Once again, as with discussions with you know how many Chikakus or whatever they could build, there are certain limitations that are not to do with the Japanese ability to pay for things, more to do with the size of shipyards and slipways. Now, whilst a heavy cruiser is considerably smaller than a Yamato class, cruisers are still pretty big ships. So there is still a limited number of slipways they can build them on. But in theory, you, you do have a few more slipways available for heavy cruiser construction. And of course, they're a bit quicker to build than Yamato and Musashi. So maybe getting another four strong class of heavy cruisers out there well they're tactically going to be more useful because the japanese might actually use them at some point before you know the end near near enough the end of the war in a directly offensive role and well yeah they will consume somewhat less resources steel wise albeit you know machinery wise possibly slightly more but nonetheless um so yeah in the early to mid part of the war just because they'll actually end up getting used on the front line. More heavy cruisers would have been better than Yamato and Musashi, although you know they're still going to be a bit vulnerable. As far as 10-inch or similar super cruisers are concerned, I don't think they'd be particularly useful for the Japanese because, well, they were looking at something akin to that anyway, but bear in mind that the Japanese will want high-speed vessels and whilst a heavy cruiser is a pretty substantial vessel, if you're building a 15, 20,000 ton supercruiser armed with 10, 11 or 12 inch guns, now you're talking something that absolutely is going to occupy one of the very few capital ship size slipways in Japan and going to take a substantial portion of time to build at which stage for all intents and purposes they're basically going to take up the same kind of slots if you like within the japanese construction uh, industry as yamato and masashi did historically except with a significantly weaker outcome at the end in terms of you know battle line units there is a marginal argument to be made there that 
again, they probably would actually get used <laughs> on the front line. So that's something. But if you're going to build something instead of Yamato Masashi, you're probably much, much better off building aircraft carriers. You know, and, and like has been discussed in a previous trial, or recently another couple of Shikakus or something like that. Mo Bossman asks, I remember the maximum range for the 16 inch 50 caliber gun is capped at something like 25 to 30 miles without doing things the guns weren't designed for, like massively overpressurizing the guns to toss a much reduced weight shell. What would it take to get 100 miles of range out of a 16 inch gun, do it safely, and retain the advantages that a gun has over rockets or missiles, whilst ha also having an effective shell? There are a few options. Fortunately, with the 16-inch 50 caliber, it has a theoretical maximum elevation in the turrets it's built with on the Iowa class that's already you know pretty good. So um, step one of making sure you can aim the gun really, really high is mostly already taken care of. Um, if you're not going to just rack up the charge, which, to be fair, isn't going to get you anywhere near 100 miles before the gun explodes... Your other options are pretty much limited to one of two things, or possibly combine the two. So the first one would be a sabode smaller caliber shell. So for example, an 8-inch shell sabode for a 16-inch gun. That's obviously going to be considerably lighter, and like the 4-inch shell that was sabode for the 8-inch gun, and so on and so forth, that will go a lot, lot further exactly how much further i believe the u.s navy looked into the idea at some point for very very long range shells but um exactly how far they went i don't think they necessarily managed to crack 100 miles but that was a post-war post-1950 study so i'm not entirely familiar with it the other major thing you could in theory do would be to make a rocket powered shell rocket assisted shell so you would fire the shell and then at some point during its journey into the sky and you pr uh, then you would have some kind of short burn rocket motor either increase its speed sustain its speed or boost its speed back up depending on you know how much you could fit into it and in theory, you could combine the two to have some kind of rocket assisted say boat eight inch shell and that probably would actually go over 100 miles assuming that you could design a rocket system on the shell that could survive being fired out of the gun in the first place which would be a interesting engineering challenge doable in theory but uh the potential for things to go very very wrong would be quite quite present there are other minor things you could do like tweaking the shell's aerodynamics making it more not of a lifting body because it's going to be rifled, so it's going to be spinning, but you know, introducing things like a, a boat tail or perhaps even um, some kind of pop-out fin stabilization for when the rifling rotation eventually wears off, which over that kind of distance it probably will. Although at that point you've come only you know, a technical step away from just inventing a gun-fired missile <laughs> or a gun-fired rocket. You know, the, the distinction between that and uh, a rocket-propelled shell is going to be very minimal by, by this stage. The bigger problem you're going to have, however, above anything else, is going to be accuracy. Because there is zero fire control systems and sensors aboard the ship which can actually let you shoot out to 100 miles. In theory, the fire control system aboard Nile can probably calculate the value for you, but you have no sensor aboard the vessel that's actually capable of telling you where the target 100 miles away is relative to you, thanks to the curvature of the Earth. You would be relying on you know, aerial spotting or forward relay data from somewhere else, which would be an interesting concept. But... A shell that's traveling that far, that's essentially a dumb shell, is going to have horrific levels of inaccuracy, no matter what you do to it. There's just far too many variables to take into account, especially when considering how high up into the atmosphere this thing is going to be going. So in order to get that thing actually, you know, functioning in any way, shape or form, you are definitely going to need guidance fins and you're going to need some kind of guidance package built into the shell as well 
which rather puts it massively beyond the capabilities of the period the channel covers uh, you'd be looking at the very minimum laser guidance and potentially later gps guidance so you're talking about you know 1970s era technology or later to get it even theoretically working and that still requires quite a lot of interesting engineering because now you've got to design a shock hardened guidance package a shock shock hardened rocket package and a shock hardened fin deployment package and yeah at that point you've basically just invented a guided missile that you're giving an extra boost out of a gun mika doggo asks i met you on the deck of uss alabama back in 2022 uh, but i got pulled off the ship during the q a so i never got to ask my question anyways my question was along the lines of could the alabama have been brought up to modernization like the iowas were post-war and how long do you think her service could have gone on yes i remember the rather wonderful wolf dog that you had with you now um with regards to alabama potentially being modernized of the fast battleship classes that the u.s has in its possession unfortunately the south dakota class is the least suitable for modernization the way the u.s navy is looking to modernize its battleships in the cold war period and that's simply because the iowas are just that much faster and at the time when they're looking into bringing back battleships at all because we're bearing in mind pretty much all of them not quite all but almost all have ended up in mothballs rather rapidly they do an analysis and they decide well at that point when the you know korea vietnam era they want to have car carriers and battleships able to operate together now for the iowas that's not a problem they're already fast enough when they look into the North Carolinas and the South Dakotas, the South Dakotas are the shortest of the three, Iowa, North Carolina, and South Dakota. And that's a problem because length to breadth ratio, breath, length to breadth ratio is important if you want to go quite fast. And they conclude that actually for either the North Carolinas or the South Dakotas, to get them up to anything approximating that kind of speed, requires so much more machinery that you have to strip out the entirety of the aft turret and the magazine and barbette etc and replace all of that plus more with machinery and even then it doesn't quite work at which point you've got a six gun battleship that's still a little bit too slow and the south dakotas were already known for being relatively cramped because you know they are treaty compliant 16 inch ships so they had to really downscale the length of the poor things to get the citadel to a point where they could actually armor it against its own guns but that assumes that we're looking at the historical precedent for the way that the u.s navy decided to bring battleships back to the front line in the aftermath of world war ii if we want to take it down another direction which is not historical but is in theory at least somewhat plausible you could look at it from a perspective of maybe the u.s navy deciding that it wants dedicated fire support vessels for which speed is somewhat less important because they're going to be accompanying amphibious invasion forces and lpds and lhds and so forth and maybe this now is more of a u.s marine corps flagship command ship and offshore bombardment support vessel etc etc now in that respect something might be done but it would require the south dakotas to be in usable condition for quite a while because this kind of thing isn't going to come up for some time you'd need the lessons of korea to be absorbed you'd need new jersey stint off vietnam to be absorbed and then someone to go aha well we're going to spend lots of money on the u.s navy and it's not just going to be a case of you know bringing back the iowas for more general naval purposes we're going to bring back the south dakotas or at least alabama specifically as you know the marine corps flagship or something like that now this could go down one of two potential routes the lower budget lower cost option would probably be stripping away all the 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter installations and this would probably be in the 70s 
So you're not necessarily going to get Tomahawk and Harpoon launchers the way the Iowas did, and there's not as much space midships anyway. So you probably maybe retain some or all of the 5-inch 38 mounts, but potentially remove the aft to and redo the aft superstructure with command and control positions, etc. And maybe some missile launchers, surface to air missile launchers, uh, some swing arm ones perhaps in place of some of the five inch battery. Because you will want at least two mounts per side for your shore bombardment fire support role anyway. So remodel the, the R superstructure and installing missile launchers in place of some of the five inch 38s and you would get a sort of basic low cost shore bombardment ship. Obviously you'd be replacing all the radars and everything with new attack. But that is potentially one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, and I apologize in advance for the absolute horror that we're about to inflict on Alabama, but given that yeah, something like this was seriously thought about at the time for the Iowas, it could happen, and that would involve stripping back pretty much everything aft of the funnel and making it into a, a legitimate battle carrier. So kind of like that her horrific uh, Iowa conversion that was going to have two ski launch ramps to launch um, AV-8A Harriers off of. Basically, you do that to Alabama, take off the aft main turret, strip away all that aft superstructure and some of the 5-inch 38 mounts, and have it embark a small air wing, probably of helicopters and Harriers for observation and short-range strike, which can go well with the Harrier becoming the US Marine Corps' uh, jet aircraft of choice aboard some of its landing ships and that will also clear some space perhaps you know in the middle of the v because you're going to have to have uh, probably some kind of small hangar internally uh, but certainly maybe some space amid the everything perhaps roughly where the front end of the of turret three is not the gun end but the front as in relative to the ship or the off superstructure somewhere in that area you might have a, a surface to air missile launch or two for for self-defense and then you have essentially a forward gun shore bombardment support vessel so the front end shoots at things at shore the back end launches aircraft uh, but to carry out precision strikes on things ashore or do um you know close in recon spotting duty perhaps with the helicopters or someone sticks an OV-10 or something on there um, and it has a limited self-defense capability as well and in that case given that you'll be operating right offshore and small and craft might come out and attack you both land and sea and air it you might even retain some of the 40 mils up front for, for those kinds of purposes. It would be an incredibly expensive process and I weep to think of the poor ship that has to undergo that process but I can see someone coming up with something like that, kind of an all singing, all dancing. It does gunfire support. It can defend itself from air threats with its own fighter wing. It can do spotting. It can do recovery. It can be a command and control ship, blah, 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 blah. And then, yes, yeah, so they're making it the US Marine Corps flagship. The man formerly known as commenting is what I do asks, in response to your answer in Drydock 281 to my question about the feasibility of turtle back dash all or nothing hybrids, given hindsight, would the major navies of World War II have been better off building the all or nothing ship with a high turtle back, as you called it, armor scheme? Seeing that long range plunging fire ended up being for all intents and purposes non-existent, it seems like one of the few times where even the allied nations ship designers made a miscalculation. It might be an idea for unlimited by treaty battleships the problem with the idea from a treaty battleship concept is that you would end up with more weight devoted to armor because of course if you have a perfectly flat upper armor deck like you see on the majority of treaty era battleship designs then you know working out the mass of that armor is quite easy it's you know well the ship varies in in width somewhat but Crudely speaking, length of armoured citadel multiplied by width of armoured citadel multiplied by thickness of deck armour, assuming you're going for single thickness, multiplied by the density of your armour steel, and that gives you the weight you devote to it all. If you go for a turtleback of any description, uh, whether that be high, low, whatever, 
And because you have the slopes, either side plus the flat, you, of course, if you're looking at it in profile, looking down the ship, you've got two hypotenuses to a right angle triangle. So that means you have slightly more total armor. The length, or, well, not the length, the length down the ship is the same, but the width across the effective width of your armor deck is more, which means you have more weight devoted to deck armor, and deck armor eats up a lot of weight already. Plus that weight is also somewhat higher in the ship than it would have been if it had just been a flat deck. And by dint of having more weight and higher weight, you are going to be eating into the requirements of, you know, what are we going to do elsewhere in the ship? Uh, you know, where, how much weight have we got for propulsion, for firepower, for um, engine power, for crew, anti-aircraft guns, etc. So you would be limiting the ship's other capabilities by doing so. And when you've only got 35,000 tons to play with, that could be a bit of a problem. If you have an unlimited ship you know that's 45 50 60 70 000 tons then you still have to deal with the issue that you are going it is going to affect stability and you are going to have to devote a greater percentage of your total mass to deck armor protection but you've got much more leeway to play with to get a suitable level of firepower and speed out of the design at the same time so yeah um theoretically potentially, but not for interwar ships, because you'd have to sacrifice a little bit too much elsewhere. The other problem, which is possibly the slightly greater one, relates to the aerial threat, because if people are dropping bombs on you, now in theory, obviously, if you've got a nice thick high turtle back armor deck, that's still going to be fine. Um, you know, you can make it as thick as anything else. But you also have the introduction on a lot of ships of what's known as variously in, by different terms, but most in English would be termed a bomb deck, which is a thinner armoured deck much higher up. And the purpose of that is to set off the fuse and marginally slow down incoming AP bombs, which makes it much easier for the main armoured deck to handle the subsequent detonation. The problem with a high turtle back is, of course, the, the deck is higher in the ship, as we mentioned earlier, which means it's closer to the bomb deck, which means there's less time for that fuse to initiate, less time for damage to destabilize or otherwise affect the bomb that's come through, and thus makes the defense against aerial bombing somewhat less effective. Now, you could, of course, argue that unless you're looking at something like a tall boy, aerial bombing against a ship is much less of a threat than torpedoing against a ship, especially a battleship with a decent amount of deck armor protection either way. And that could be a valid counter-argument, but compared to a completely regular all-or-nothing ship with a flat armored deck and a bomb deck above it, a high turtle back ship is going to be marginally less effective at defeating incoming bombs. So within the context of the interwar period, I don't think the Allied Nations uh, made a miscalculation when they decided to go with the layout that they did. In theory, again, with a unlimited design with much more space to play with, you know, the, the, the gap between the bomb deck and your armor deck could also be adjusted. Um, so perhaps for something like an, not even necessarily an Iowa, because an Iowa is still limited somewhat. You know, it's designed to a specific displacement, 45,000 tons, and it has a priority of getting fast. But for, you know, something like a Soviet Project 24 or a Montana or a Yamato, etc., maybe even for some of the latter stage Lions, where you're looking at not so much we must build to this exact displacement limit, but more we must address these threats and see what displacement that ship comes out at, then you might be able to, I think, argue for this kind of armor scheme to be put in, although with all the limitations and caveats I just mentioned. Helmet That asks, a lot has been made about how the American ships carried heavier guns in the War of 1812 ship duels. Would you say that overconfidence among British captains and the substandard gunnery of the Halifax and Bermuda squadrons played a greater role? I think it depends very much on the ship, because of course Shannon did not have 
inadequate substandard gunnery. And you can raise some questions about perhaps Java's gunnery, but it wasn't awful. It wasn't as good as Constitution's, but it, it wasn't bad. You know, Java in a fight against uh, French 24-pounder frigate probably would have pulled off the win. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it depends on the exact ship. Guerrier, um, overconfidence, yeah, that probably was the doom of Guerrier. She was really not capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Constitution. Um, and, you know, let's face it, size, crew, firepower-wise, Guerrier was completely outmatched. You know, all the paper stats. It's just that the British, had, as I covered in that and subsequent videos, had gotten so overconfident by facing off against crews who just weren't as good as, at them as them and therefore had gotten used to being able to carry off quite often victories against considerably larger ships that they thought they could pull this off against the Americans as well without stopping to check for a second as to whether or not the American crews were as bad as your average French or Spanish crew of the late 1700s and early 1800s or whether they were as good as or better than the standard British crew because if they were, even if we say they were on a par um, to forestall nationalistic arguments and so forth, if you've got two crews that are broadly similar and one of them has the bigger and better ship, then clearly that one's going to have the advantage in any kind of major engagement. Now, if you mix in overconfidence and poor gunnery, you get Macedonian. So, yeah, in that engagement, very definitely that plays a greater role than perhaps necessarily the heavier firepower of the American ship in that particular case. Because to be perfectly honest, you could have taken the American crew at that point and put them in a carbon copy of Macedonian and they still would have won, in my opinion. But the heavier guns do still make quite a bit of a difference. And it's not just, you know, as you might think in later eras where 14 inch versus 12 inch or 16 inch versus 14 inch or something like that. It's not just the absolute caliber and weight of shot it's what that implies because at close range like you see here 24 pounder 18 pounder shot i'm going to go through either side pretty much as makes no difference but a 24 pounder solid shot is going to impart more energy so if for sake of example it strikes goes through the planking hits a frame that's going to explode out the into the enemy ship with considerably more force and you know more splinters and so forth than the 18 pounder the 24 pounder can also if it's firing grape shot or canister will be firing either more or larger projectiles which can therefore do more damage when it's firing dismantling shot star shot bar shot chain shot whatever that is going to have more of effect on the masts and the rigging because you know the chain will be slightly longer the bars will be slightly longer the overall chance of hitting something and the effect of that impact is going to be slightly larger and even when you're doing something like say hitting a mast with a solid shot a hit by an 18 pounder might damage that mast a hit by a 24 pounder might break that mast because of the additional energy involved and all these little bits, you know, just because of that slightly larger size and slightly more energy, when you're talking about an Age of Sail battle, where you're talking about dozens of hits, it all adds up. And it doesn't take much for a kind of chain reaction to begin. So, you know, if you exchange broadsides and your broadside causes 25% more casualties than the enemy's broadside does, well, when it comes to the second broadside, you're more likely to get your second broadside off faster which in turn means probably even more casualties caused on the enemy side, and it very rapidly spirals down from there. And, you know, similarly, when you look at, for example, probably the best example is Constitution versus Java, the third of the, the big frigate duels. And Constitution has damage to her masts and her rigging and her sails, and it's, you know, damage that's bad enough that it needs Constitution to stand off for a bit to repair, and then between both the damage and the fact that a lot of the resources are being diverted to the Great Lakes, she spends quite a bit of time in refit in 1813. But in exchange, her fire is able to dismast, essentially over time, 
Java. And to a certain extent, that can be attributed to the additional hitting power of the 24-pounder versus the 18-pounder. And you've got carronades and so forth as well. So whilst in overconfidence amongst British captains does play a role in some defeats, substandard gunnery plays a role in some defeats, heavier guns also plays a role in the British defeats, but exactly which one contributes the most out of those and other factors very much depends on the specific engagement and the specific captain. Gautierger asks, I'm told that in 1941, the Admiralty made a request to private yards to design and build anti-invasion submarines with a build time of eight months. If the program had been brought to fruition, how do you suppose the boats would have been used, given that they would obviously not get the opportunity to fulfil their design purpose, thanks to the lack of a German invasion? Now, I'll admit this is something I have not heard of before, so if you could drop me a message either on Patreon or via Discord or whatever uh, with some links or whatever to, you know, more information about these uh, theoretical anti-invasion -anti submarines the Admiralty was looking at, I'd be most grateful because, hey, it's something new I can learn about a period which I thought I had fairly well covered. But nevertheless, um, from the wording of the question, it seems the program was not brought to fruition. However... Based on that, assuming that, you know, if private yards are being asked to well, design and build a, a quick anti-invasion sub, then I suspect it will probably fall into one of two categories. Either someone's going to take a very small submarine like, say, the U-Class, and then look at the potential you know, usage case of the channel, not particularly deep for the most part, at least in the areas where you're going to be worried about the invasion craft I off the shores of France and off the shores of the UK, and essentially maybe make a really slimmed down version of the U-class or something similar thereunto. So, you know, slightly thinner or lower grade steel for the pressure hull because you aren't going to need to go to oceanic depths um maybe not so, so much fuel because you're not going to need to go particularly long range um, but maybe slightly higher power engines and or maybe because you're using less fuel um perhaps more batteries to go faster and further underwater because you're going to be in very contested areas with lots of aircraft around and probably a maximal torpedo arm. So they might take a lesson out of, say, the T-Class and have a bunch of one-shot launchers up there because, you know, the, again, very contested waters. You might be expecting this rather small sub to just sneak in and just salvo a massive number of torpedoes off and either then make a run for it or be attacked. It's not necessarily going to be a sub that's going to be coming back for multiple attempts on long patrols. So, you know, biggest punch forward possible immediately and possibly with more disposable launchers aft so you'd maybe run in launch a nice big salvo six or eight torpedoes forward you maybe only have two or four tubes that you can actually reload but then as you spin around to retreat you can maybe salvo four or six more torpedoes aft even if you can only have one or two available there to reload um, so that would be one option and the other option would just essentially be X craft, um, which you can see here, small midget subs, which can get in really close into the shallows, really small, not even necessarily on with torpedoes at that point, but just leaving random packages of explosives around in places the Germans really don't want them to be. Uh, now, for X craft, the use case is fairly obvious, um, or something akin to them, that you just use them as the historical X craft were used. If this kind of shallow depth, rapid construction, um, high speed high heavy punch submarine was invented for anti-invasion duty which is the, the first theoretical example then if they were then built and used in the rest of the second world war i could see them perhaps being used in the channel to monitor uh german activity on the french coast and so forth or perhaps as backups for 
the X craft, so maybe towed by larger subs to positions nearer to German shipping lanes and stuff, where they would undertake rather than a more careful, precise, close in stalking method, you would maybe use them in small groups. And, you know, not quite wolf packs because that suggests a degree of hunting. This would be kind of uh, point at the enemy and <laughs> like the blue touch paper just to salvo large numbers of torpedoes into enemy convoys or into harbors and stuff again using their speed and and small size to get into advantageous positions and then just turning around and legging it back they probably wouldn't be of tremendously much use to be perfectly honest i think that the recon element would probably be a lot stronger for them and then again you might see them deployed as say part of force k in malta uh, again, for you know, attacking Italian convoys where uh, the Allies have reasonable intel of when and where they'd be sailing, so the short range doesn't matter so much. You just send them out, they wait for the convoy, and they either spot it or they don't. If they don't, they come back, and if they do, they just get into something approximating a decent fire position, send a couple of big salvos of torpedoes downrange, and then run away! <laughs> Rebel Scavell asks, We know lightning strikes on wooden ships with their tall masts were as a serious hazard, but what about ships in the age of steam and steel? How significant a problem could a lightning strike on a battleship's mainmast or spotting top be for the vessel, and how did navies take steps to mitigate such an event? It's a little bit of one, some and a little bit of another, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. On the one hand, by the time you get to the age of steam and steel, you don't have soaked wooden masts, so the chance of your mast being blown apart by a lightning strike, as happened here to poor old Suriname, is somewhat reduced. The flip side to that is, of course, if your masts and the rest of your ship is primarily made out of steel, then the chance of a lightning strike conducting across and through a significantly greater portion of the ship is much much higher so you know if you're on a wooden ship and you're let's say at the bow and the main mast gets hit you're probably okay from the first order effects you might get hit by falling debris but you're probably not going to be electrocuted whereas if let's say you were on the for whatever reason i can't imagine why you would be but if you were on the forecastle of a cruiser in the second world war for example and the foremast which is by that point the mast that's immediately above the bridge takes a direct hit from a lightning strike the lightning if nothing else is done conducting its way through the outer skin of the ship will possibly also electrocute you i mean there's a decent chance you're wearing rubber sole boots so you might be fine but you really don't want to be holding onto a railing or something at that, at that point the and of course ships by the age of steam and steel are, ha, have progressively more and more electronics aboard so there's a potential for circuitry and equipment to be fused the spotting top in and of itself is probably not at too much risk um there's you know, it's optical equipment with mechanically adjusted parts until you get to the radar era, obviously. So optical spotting equipment, unless it gets hit by such a powerful lightning bolt and a, maybe even a direct hit that it fuses something through heating. But outside of that, it's not a huge risk. You still don't want to be holding on to it at the time uh, for obvious reasons. Radar obviously is, is a bit more directly affected, but the transmission of data via cabling down into the ship that might very well be affected and I'm pretty sure the guys at the other end in the fire control section don't want the massive power surge that's coming their way but again this is what fuses and breakers are for and this is also what copper conducting strips are for you know, <laughs> to encourage the electricity to please flow in the requisite direction rather than everywhere else and there's also, you know, something of a mitigation of the fact that the majority of a ship's deck will be made up of teak. So if, for example, the battleship's foremast or mainmast is hit, if it's a, you know, a tripod mast, pretty typical, or a pole mast, it will mostly probably conduct down that, even if your, um, you know, copper lightning strip isn't fully in place or whatever, it'll conduct down that. That's anchored at various points on the ship, but it'll include passing through the upper deck, uh, 
And at that point, the upper deck, if you're in a storm, it's going to be soaked through. If you're standing on the teak deck, that's going to give you a degree of insulation as the electricity passes under you and probably oh, mostly over the sides via the soaked metal that provides a direct conductive pathway. There still obviously could be blowback elsewhere in the, in the ship from electrical surging. But again, this is what you have surge protectors for. And this is why you have lightning conductor rods and strips, etc., to move the electricity to places you would rather it be, like not on your ship. The other thing is if you've got long radio aerial wires running from between the masts or possibly, you know, even in form in the form of general cabling or radio cabling from your forecastle to the foremast to the main mast and down to the stern, whether that's metal wire, radio cabling or whatever, that's going to be a soaked line, which can also provide a conductive, if somewhat unintentional element away from the body of the ship. Dr. D.M. Platt asks, if you were to select one ship to be a museum or war memorial for each of the navies listed below to commemorate their service in World War II, which ship would you choose and why? Well, for the Royal Navy and the US Navy, that's easy. War Spite and Enterprise. That's pretty much my go-to answer whenever this question comes up for those two navies. Now, as for the others, the Canadian Navy, well, they've got Hyda. I think they should stick with Hyda. So that's why she's gracing your screens at the moment. The New Zealand Navy, I would probably go with HM, HMNZS Ajax. Because, well, she was at the Battle of the River Plate. Uh, admittedly, she wasn't HMNZS just yet. But of the various ships that flew, flew the New Zealand flag in World War II... She's got, you know, the biggest historical draw to her. For the Australian Navy, I would probably go with HMAS Australia. Now, that's a difficult one because I would be very tempted to go with one of the Scrap Iron Flotilla destroyers instead. But I think going with the Australia, it, it just edges the Scrap Iron Flotilla out for me in view of the fact that Australia obviously not only made it through the war, as did some of the Scrap Iron Flotilla, but actually was on the front lines right up until the last, including obviously that absolute pasting from the kamikazes. So it encapsulates the Australian experience end to end. The Russian Navy, I'd probably go with Tashkent, because I like Tashkent, and... You know, she did a fair bit until she was sunk running around in the Black Sea. You know, yes, there were various cruisers and some of the old battleships and so forth, but Tashkent actually got up to quite a bit in her relatively short lifespan. I suppose a, a second place for that would maybe be whichever one of the gangots it was that got sunk at, um, well, what's now St. Petersburg, whatever, like they call it Leningrad at the time, I think, um, and was then used as a you know, a, a slightly wet gun battery. For the Norwegian Navy, I would go with the destroyer Stord. I believe that's how it's pronounced, probably wrong. But anyway, uh, she was credited as the most aggressive and daring destroyer during the Battle of the North Cape and landed several hits on Scharnhorst. So that pretty much not gets her into the books, I think. For the Japanese, I'm actually going to go for Yukikaze. You know, bravely going where everybody else has died before <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Yukikaze, I think, pretty much sums up the Japanese war experience in World War II very, very nicely. You know, much as it would be interesting to have a Yamato floating around as a museum ship or whatever, um, if you try to list what did Yamato do in World War II, it's a very short list. If you list what did Yukikaze do and how many other things died nearby her, that's a very long list. For the Italians, I would go with the Giulio Cesare, mostly because of the really unique history of that ship, you know, modernizations, fighting war spite, being given over to the Russians. And of course, it would mean that she doesn't mysteriously blow up and sink if she's a museum ship for the Italian Navy, eventually. For the Germans, I'd go with Prince Eugen. That's a relatively inoffensive choice. And hey, again, it mean it would mean that she somehow survived crossroads. Um, 
for the French Navy. See, because the problem is with the French Navy, there wasn't a huge amount they actually got to do before France got knocked out of the war. Part of me really wants Richelieu or Jean Bar, just because they're really nice ships. Uh, but another part of me actually kind of wants Algerie, to be honest, because as I've said before, Algerie, to my mind, is probably the single best balanced of the treaty era heavy cruisers and shows that you can somehow pull such a thing off. So, yeah. Algerie or Jean Bar. Brian Stevens asks, We all hear about piracy in the age of sail around the Barbary coast and the Caribbean. Are there other hotspots in the time that are less well known? Well, it depends how flexible you want to be with the term age of sail. If you want to define it as you know, the classic age of sail, which is depending on exactly who you talk to, either from roughly the late Tudor period to the 1850s, or maybe from the Anglo-Dutch Wars to the 1850s, or some people even just say the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, then it's a little narrower. But even within that scope, you've got things like the China coast. Uh, yeah, uh, the Chinese really know how to organise themselves from pirating. Uh, there were, you know, really, really powerful pirate groups there, which had fleets numbering in the hundreds. And uh, problems of pirates off the China coast continued well into the 1930s. Uh, really, only the Second World War, at least temporarily, brought that to an end. Then you've got, as well as the Barbary Coast, you have the northeast coast of Africa, dash the Arabian Peninsula. That area was absolutely rife with pirates. Um... Madagascar, Zanzibar area also was plagued at various points. Essentially, wherever you had a concentration of trade routes or some particularly rich trading ports and the area wasn't already owned and or dominated by a particularly powerful navy, you got pirates. You would, of course, have the occasional, well, depending on who you ask, either piratical or privateer problems all along the Spanish-controlled coasts of South America, mostly English, but also Dutch and various others. But in terms of an ongoing perennial problem, that wasn't so much of an issue because Spain and Portugal controlled pretty much the entire coastline of South America, which made it a lot harder for pirates to set up bases there. If you wind the Age of Sail back a little bit to the medieval period, then also the English Channel was absolutely rife with pirates uh, to a certain extent the southern north sea as well because you had the various german uh, states you know because there wasn't a germany at that point you had burgundy you had Brittany, which for a good chunk of that time was independent you had of course france england scotland various permutations of scandinavian countries uh, the, what would later become the various Dutch states as well, so and everyone else from elsewhere who was coming by to trade. So there was always going to be someone somewhere that you could predate on if you were a pirate at that stage, and someone else who would be very happy you predated on them and would give you shelter. <laughs> it, it was a little bit of a mess. Of course, the fact there wasn't really massive, formally organised royal fleets at that point also made it somewhat easier to be a pirate, albeit the average merchant ship relative to a warship of the time, was much more capable of defending itself, which uh, made the challenge a little bit harder. At some point, I've got to do a video on Jean de Clisson, um, or I don't, I don't know how exactly you, you feminize that in French. I think it's Jean. I think it's Jean either way. Anyway, um, Jeanne, maybe? Um, yeah, anyway, she's a medieval noble lady whose husband was executed, well, one of her husbands, was executed for treason, and she decided, um, well, being you know, partly from Brittany, and as I said, Brittany was sort of semi-independent, dash feudal for a long period of this point, she turned around and went, yes, I, I do not like this French king. That's a terrible French accent. I'm going to stop doing that now. Um, yeah, she said, I don't like this French king executing my husband for what I believe are trumped-up reasons. I am therefore going to become a pirate queen and 
you know, burn, pillage and loot my way through the French king's possessions on the North French coast, be that ships, towns or whatever else I can get my hands on until I've decided to have my, you know, requisite measure of revenge. And boy, does she have some anger issues if the number of towns and and uh, ships she plundered and burnt is anything to go by. Nick Brodar asks, During World War II, how close did the Royal Navy come to losing control of the Eastern Mediterranean during the Battle of Crete? I think it depends on what definition you use for losing control of the Eastern Mediterranean. Certainly, if you define the Eastern Mediterranean as, say, from Italy East or Malta East, somewhere in that region, a good chunk of that area was then sort of passed over, not necessarily to access control, but at least to access initiative, uh, in part because between losses and damage, the Royal Navy's heavy forces, i.e. anything cruiser and up, were significantly reduced in the aftermath of Crete to the point that if the Italians had put themselves out to sea with everything they had available in in that kind of weight class, there's precious little the Royal Navy could have done to oppose them in a straight-up surface action. They just would have been so horribly outnumbered. The flip side, of course, is that the Italians did not do that, and the Battle of Crete, as I've said a few times before, comes with the notable and often very overlooked absolute massacre of the seaborne invasion element of Crete. Um, So the Royal Navy showed it definitely was still in the running from that perspective. But the Royal Navy, if you look at the entirety of the Eastern Mediterranean, including the bit to the southeast of Crete, you know, heading towards Alexandria, the Royal Navy never lost control of that portion of the Med. So its area of control was significantly reduced, as were its ship numbers. And as I say, one good big operation by the Regia Marina might have then forced the Royal Navy to either to retreat or to give a battle on very unfavorable terms. So there was certainly the threat of that. But uh, without it coming off, you know, the Royal Navy was able to regroup, regather new forces, and then push back out again. But in theory, you know, in a kind of butterfly flaps its wings scenario, yeah, maybe one or two big naval and air operations by the Italians and the Germans, and the Royal Navy might have lost control of the Eastern Mediterranean almost entirely. The Rogue Chief asks, as the final question for this week, given the culture of the Royal Navy at the time, what would be the realistic reaction to the officers aboard HMS Victoria and Camperdown had they ignored Tryon's order, which led to the collision? I think it would depend quite a lot on how they ignored the order. So, obviously, the order was, you know, the fleet's in two sections. They're supposed to essentially loop back and join up in one column. Doesn't really go very well. If the camper down had seen the signal from Tryon and gone, nah, that's that's stupidly dangerous, and ignored the order and just continued to sail in two parallel columns... Yeah, they would have been in a bit of trouble because it was an order from the commander-in-chief. They ignored it. The whole point of the exercise was to reform it, trying to make that clear before. Um, That would have been, you know, basically the end of it. Because what could they offer in justification at a court-martial? Well, I saw this order and I thought it might lead to a collision. The counter-argument to that being, well, you don't know that that would have been the case. And moreover, you know, again, putting myself in the role of the prosecuting counsel, do you think the Admiral is dumb enough to make that kind of decision? Uh, To order something that would guarantee cause a collision? Are your ship handling skills not good enough to ensure you could carry out his orders and not collide with the flagship? I think at that point, your career is essentially over. However, if you were looking at the situation from Camperdown and Victoria begin to execute the turn and then officers on one or both ships go, I don't think this is going to end well and perhaps Camperdown orders full reverse or changes course slightly and Victoria orders all ahead full or possibly vice versa, Victoria ordering full reverse and Camperdown going all ahead full, although I think that's less helpful and less likely. 
Um, so the fleet slightly breaking with formation and strictly speaking what Tryon had ordered, but that results in either just the two ships missing each other or potentially even Camperdown swinging in behind Victoria as had been intended by Tryon, at least according to one theory. Then at that point, it would have been a completely different scenario because, yes, the general culture might have said, oh, yes, well, you, you should really obey the uh, commander in chief's orders in all cases, but try and specifically, again, according to one of the major theories which I tend to subscribe to when it comes to this particular collision, which is that Tryon was trying to force his officers to think for themselves rather than just blindly obey every signal that was sent out, Tryon probably would have absolutely fated them and gone, you know, congratulations you got the spirit of what i was trying to say and you executed it even if you didn't strictly stick to the, the exact signal that i'd sent that's exactly the kind of initiative i want to see well done you know tea cakes and medals and all that kind of stuff uh which point there sort of been a, maybe a bit of muttering about oh I'll try and his uncouth un, unregistered methods of training people mustache twirl mustache twirl what 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 um but yeah, at the same time, it would be one of Britain's leading upcoming admirals going, excellent work, men, at which point everybody else would probably just, you know, if for nothing else, just but to advance their career, would be trying to follow in their footsteps. And knowing the Royal Navy, that could lead to at least a cadre of officers trying to do more and more insanely ridiculous things with more and more implausibly stupid orders and then somehow executing them by making slight variations in what they actually did that does sound like something some of the royal navy officers would do and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening everybody i hope to see you again in another video very soon possibly even a live stream who knows